One of the things that's so exciting to us here at the MDI Biological Laboratory about Science Cafes is that it really allows us a wonderful platform to share a little bit about our enthusiasm for science in any number of areas. So not just necessarily in biomedical sciences, but also in other areas like the one that we're talking about today. I'm sure that all of you are here just because you're super excited about science, not because you're super excited about cider. But we'll, we'll just that. Um, but <laughs> yeast, that's right. Anyway, we're really excited about our presentation this afternoon. We have Todd Little Siebold with us from the College of the Atlantic. And if any of you have heard him speak, you know that he is really passionate about the historical um, aspects of, of the aquaculture in Maine and elsewhere here in New England. And so I guarantee that you're going to learn a lot of really interesting bits about the apple industry in Maine that you didn't know about before. And then we have Ellie, who is with us here from the MDI Biological Lab. She's also known, for those of you on Twitter, as Scientist Ellie, and she does an amazing job. So each of you are going to have an opportunity to be a little bit of a scientist today. And we're super excited to have your presentation. So thank you both so much for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Can you hear me now? Is this working? OK, so I'm Ellie, and I work here at the lab as a research assistant. And this is a far cry from what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. But I'm here because I love to talk about science in any capacity, and also because I love good food and good drink. And I have a deep appreciation for the microorganisms that are going to make that possible for us. Great. And I'm Todd Little Siebold. I'm a professor of history at the College of the Atlantic. And um, Apple obsessed somewhat. So um, what we're going to do today is sort of a tag team where I'm going to talk about the historical aspects. Start out with a little bit of why, <clears throat> how this came to be, how, how working between historians and scientists um, allows us to answer questions that we couldn't otherwise answer. Um, I'll share some of the stuff that I geek out about, which is the history of apples uh, and cider in Maine, but worldwide. But also the, the fascinating aspects when you rethink history, um, taking into account the microorganisms that basically have literally fed humans for thousands of years. So we're going to have fun sort of tag teaming this. Our goal is to try to um, leave about 15 minutes at the end for, for robust back and forth. <clears throat> So I think it's really important to ask, um, what are the questions about history um, where transdisciplinary thinking and collaboration are required? Not, help, not, not interesting or fun or illuminating, but actually required for you to be able to answer a question that you might have. And we're going to talk about a few of those tonight. Um, and in my case, what are the historical questions where scientific techniques and molecular analysis, in particular, provide new pathways forward to questions that I can't find in an archive. I can't find in publications. I can't find from doing oral histories. And then what are the scientific approaches um, that are enriched and require historical perspectives and a historian skill? So we'll talk um, sort of ex explicitly about that. So I do this almost every talk, just because I'm not sure everybody knows this. And it's, this is the most important thing to know about apples. And this is a uh, Roxbury russet. It's a little soft right now. Uh, it's been in my cellar for the, uh, for the winter. Um, <clears throat> and I think most people don't know this, and so it's very important to start with this, because it's one of the things we're going to touch on. Every seed in this apple is genetically unique. Every single seed in this apple, and then every single seed in every single Roxbury russet from this tree is genetically unique. So every year. This Roxbury russet tree that I picked this from produces brand new varieties that have never existed before. Um, and that if I take this Roxbury russet and I plant it, I'll get something that could be like this. I could get something that's small. I could get something that looks like a crab apple. I could even get something that looks like a very traditional variety called a Wolf River that's, that's like this. Even from in, within this one apple, I could get that. So one thing that you almost have to understand in terms of talking about the history of apples is that, and we'll talk about the science of this, um, is that every seed is unique. There are some varieties. Duchess of Oldenburg is one common in Maine. 
that comes relatively true to seed. But the diversity that we see in apples is basically an uh, aspect of the specific um, genetics of apples that make them into these huge diversity <laughs> machines. And that's great for fresh eating. It produces thousands of varieties, as I'll talk about in a moment. It's also <laughs> great for cider because it produces a lot of apples that are edible but not palatable. Um, we call them spitters. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if I can't take this and plant it and get a Roxbury russet, how could I get a Roxbury russet? Well, it turns out, um, since Roman times, since Greek times, people have been doing grafting, which is a way of cloning the variety that you have, uh, onto an, a rootstock. Um, this is probably, this is a Roman mosaic um, from the second century BC. Um, so we have, this is a direct evidence of grafting technologies. They used it for olives, they used it for, um, they used it for grapes, they used it for many other things. But this is um, a fruit tree. And in Pliny the Elder, um, in his natural histor histories, he lists the varieties of apples that the Romans had. And they, they even, um, in other earlier botanical um, sources, the list of varieties that, were ha that they had in Greece. So we know that some of these varieties are propagated over thousands of years, in fact. So <coughs> this, um, this is uh, somewhat comically named, how do we get to Macintosh? Um, so apples did not exist in North America. Um, there are several species of what we would call crab apples, small, um, relatively unpalatable um, varieties. The closest one in distribution to us would be in western um, <coughs> New York, Vermont, Massachusetts border, called uh, Malus coronaria. Little green, uh, terrible tasting little thing. Um, <laughs> So apples that we have today, domestica, come from Kazakhstan, from the Tian Shen Mountains in um, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, western China. And they slowly move west um, through trade routes over about 1,000 years and end up in Persia, um, the Fertile Crescent, and then uh, are brought across to the Greeks, the Greeks to the Romans, the Romans then bring them to western yes. Europe. And that's about 3,000 years of history that I just mentioned. So then those are brought, um, so they're established in places like England by the Romans and then brought um, in, the first, um, in the first shipments across the Atlantic, probably as seed, um, because most apples in England were for drinking. They were not for fresh eating. So they were planting primarily cider and cider vinegar, this was a, some cider that I made that turned to vinegar, um, unintentionally. Uh, but they needed it for prever preserving their food. So they brought the apples with them very early on. <clears throat> One of the questions, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about this a little bit later, that is now possible to answer that um, I could probably not answer through archival research. It is very, very likely that Basque, Norman, and Galician fishermen bring apples to the coast of Maine in the late 15th century, maybe the early 16th century. They were, they were fishing here early on. And on the offshore islands today, it's possible, I think, we're going to write a grant to see if we can figure this out, to sample the apples on offshore islands, which are genetically isolated from the mainland, um, to see if we can detect whether they're Spanish apples, French apples, or English apples because we can, collect, we can compare them to the collections that have been put together in several different countries. And so we, we can know, probably within five years, whether the Spanish, it will not surprise you, are quite sure that they introduced apples to America. Uh, but we can, rather than it being speculative, we can, uh, we can find that out. There are two sites in Maine where French apples may exist from the 17th century, Castine and Norwich Walk. Uh, and it will be possible, I think, with this project that we hope to carry out, um, to determine whether French apples are still in, in existence around Castine, around Nor Norwich Walk. Um, <clears throat> the thing that's so interesting about this is that orcharding in Maine really does not exist in any serious way until after what we call the French and Indian War, it's also known as the Seven Years' War, in the 1760s. <clears throat> 
And so this area is very typical of many parts of Maine where people came and settled and then immediately planted um, cider orchards. Um, this period from about 1760 to 1830 is a period where the primary reason people had orchards was for cider, for drinking. Uh, and then temperance movements come in in the 1830s, the, the production of cider, the demand for cider declines because of this growth of a moral reform movement and uh, American farmers switch over to growing apples like the Roxbury russet or um, other eating apples. So early apple history in Maine is basically cider history. Later apple history is eating apples. Um, <clears throat> so one thing, again, about apples that's, for me, and particularly fascinating is that by the time um, Say by the 1920s, there were probably 22 to 28,000 named varieties of apples. Close to 1,000 of those would have been grown in Maine, 1,000 distinct varieties of apples. And um, I've been able to document over 200 just being grown on MDI and in Hancock County. So you can see this radical diversity that comes from the sort of genetic uh, predilection of apples then leads to this radical diversity of apples that explodes across the country. And that's one of the things that I've really dedicated um, my recent work to, is trying to track down the old varieties before they're lost. Maine is interesting because there's a sort of an, an explosion, an export boom from about 1850 to 1890, 1920, where Maine is shipping two million barrels a year to England. The English decided it was much easier to have the colonies grow their food for them, their former colonies, so they just imported apples from uh, Canada and the United States. Um, and the one thing vis-a-vis -vis app cider production is there's this collapse of cider production in the 1830s. It slowly recovers in the 19th century. And home cider production, cider production just for the farmstead, continues really up until the 1960s and 70s. People still were doing it just on a home scale um, all over Maine until that time period. And really, that is fascinating because basically, um, if you meet somebody um, in their 80s or 90s in rural Maine, many will be able to recount cider uh, being produced in their house. Uh, but nobody who's, say, younger than 70 um, in most communities in Maine actually did it. So it was really something that their grandparents did and it dies off in the um, second half of the 20th century. One thing, people often talk about prohibition wiping out cider. Um, they could still produce 200 gallons for home consumption, and I think I calculated at one point if every farmer in Maine did that. <laughs> Something like 5 million gallons um, being produced. So, um, so it's very interesting to think about all of the changes in apple production, but then use over this time period that we're talking about. Um, this is one of the trees that we found over, actually, uh, Rudy is here who's found, who found this. This is uh, called Jake 1829. It's in the Maine Heritage Orchard. It's 11 and a half feet in circumference. And it's probably 200 to 240 years old, something like that. Um, Still producing fruit. Actually, I guess uh, Rudy said it had some damage this winter, but still producing beautiful fruit every year. Um, and what's so fun about this is <laughs> I used to think we were going to find out the name of that apple tree. But I've gotten to the point where I really don't care. If it's 240 years old, uh, we'll just make up a name and keep it alive for the next generation. Because the names are really fascinating. The stories are absolutely fascinating. And one of the things that we're finding is many of the very, very old trees, 9, 10, 11 feet in, in diameter um, or in circumference, um, I, we don't think they've ever been documented. We think they, people just grew them. And so I have hundreds and hundreds of names of apples that I've tracked down in Maine. Um, and I'm, I'm certain that something like this one in Tremont, uh, the chances of us ever, A, discovering it, and B, it having been documented anywhere is actually quite low. And luckily, every year we find a couple more. So, so I'm going to turn it over to Ellie to talk about why there's so many apple yeah, types of apples. I mean, that's my question from all of this: is why are there so many different types of apple? 
Um, and they can be so genetically diverse and so visually diverse, different shapes, colors, aroma profiles. Are they good for eating or do you wanna spit them out? And you might have something like a crab apple where unless you really knew what you were looking for, you wouldn't even necessarily know that it was an apple. Um, so of course it comes down to genetics. And we do have an apple <coughs> genome that's sequenced since 2010. Um, and it's a huge genome. So apples have 17 chromosomes, which is less than R23, but it's more than others from the family Rosaceae, which is where they come from. So at some point, the entire genome uh, was doubled. Um, so they have twice as much source for genetic diversity. Um, they're mostly diploid like us, which means they have two copies of each chromosome, but they can be tri triploid as well, which means they have three copies, so that's one more source of variability in there. And they have a ton of genes, over 57,000 genes um, that are protein coding in the apple genome. So at the time, this was the most of any plant that had been sequenced, and it's not the most anymore. I think canola oil surpassed it, but um, it has, it's still really up there. So that's a lot of different um, ways for variation to sneak in there. And 20% of those genes are specific to the apple, so they don't have any homolog in any known plant. Um, and super interesting to the cider maker, even just the apple eater, uh, over 1,200 of those genes are specific to producing volatiles and aromatics and pigments and antioxidants and all the things that make a cider really wonderful. The other thing that's really cool about apples is that they are what botanists call extreme heterozygotes. So uh, a heterozygous individual has two different variants of the genes that it has on its two different chromosomes. Um, as opposed to a homozygote, which has two of the same variants on each of its chromosomes. So um, an extreme heterozygote is going to mean that there is an increase in the amount of, uh, of variability in that entire population, which usually means there's some sort of um, uh, genetic uh, uh, variation that is selected for, or there might be a really high incidence of recombination, which is probably the case. Both of those are probably the case for wild apples. Um, we can use what we know about genetics to help identify apples. There's a very cool database called Fruit ID. We couldn't call it Apple ID because that was already taken. <laughs> but this has a really great uh, documentation of several hundred apple varieties. Not only does it have pictures and um, nice documentation of what the leaves look like and other things like that, but they also offer a DNA barcoding service. So that um, totally surpasses the, the, um, uh, the necess necessity of sequencing because DNA barcoding just uses um, fragments of the genome and a simpler method of PCR to produce a unique fingerprint for each variety of apple. But the limitation of this, of course, is that there's only a couple hundred that are documented in this way that have specific DNA barcodes. Um, and Todd just talked about thousands. <laughs> yep. One thing about that that's quite interesting is um, some of the people who are doing genetic work, particularly at Washington State, have become interested in the heirloom collections that um, a number of organizations have around the country. So one of the things that we're trying to do is help increase the number of the traditional varieties that um, are in the reference collection so that we can expand the likelihood that when somebody searches for an apple, they'll actually find it. We have about 300 varieties in our collection at, at MOFCA, at the Main Heritage Orchard. Um, the Temperate Orchard Society has about 5,000. Um, so pretty quickly, if we can uh, collaborate with them, to quickly develop these barcodes for, at least for those uh, almost 6,000 varieties would be available for, for this kind of um, scanning. And the interesting thing for, for me in terms of some of this genetic ID work is A, very quickly, even if it's not in a collection, um, it can tell you if you have duplicates in a collection. It can immediately tell you if it's the same thing. Um, and then it'll also allow you to slowly build a collection by knowing what you don't have. And that's uh, one of the things that we're 
really focusing on at the Maine Heritage Orchard is trying to track down some, some of the very old <coughs> varieties. Um, I want to talk just very briefly about alf, apple sleuthing and fruit exploration because it connects to this, this kind of work. Um, this is another tree that I estimate to be in a sort of 200-year-old range. Um, this is from Cape Jellison over in Stockton Springs, close to what was the earliest English fort in northern Maine. It's on the back side of the island um, in an area that was relatively protected from the river. Uh, and there are two of these huge trees, one on, on the east side and one on the west side. So these are imaginatively named uh, Cape Jellison East and Cape Jellison West. <laughs> um, because somebody needs to be able to go back to that place and find that tree again and again and again. Um, and one of the things that we really try to do is to work through local networks, people who know where their old trees, um, people who will say, well, you should go look at this tree, you should go look at that tree. And occasionally, somebody will be able to point to the tree and say that. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, apple sleuthing stories of mine. Um, I was up in Orrington visiting an old, um, older woman named Josie Quimby, who was on her family's farm that they had had for five or six generations. We're walking through her orchard, and she says, um, that's a Macintosh, that's a delicious, and that's a northern greening. And I say, uh, Josie, I've um, never heard of northern greening. I've heard of northwestern greening. Are you sure it was northern greening? And she said, young man, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, she said, my grandfather grafted these apples to be sent to, to England in the ballast of the ships to be sold there. Um, once we knew we had a northern greening, we found uh, we had collected the identical apple six miles away in Orland. Um, so these kinds of examples are really fascinating because if, if you just wish, you hope that somebody will be able to point to a tree and tell you uh, what they are. Because otherwise, what you're doing is swimming in a sea of descriptions trying to guess what it is. And I spent some of my most recent sabbatical doing that. And it is extremely tedious work. Uh, because what you have to do is you have to go off of terrible descriptions, generally. Um, and even the good descriptions uh, are um, difficult when you're looking at it to decide whether you, uh, whether the top is acute or acuminate and those sorts of things. So I figure I have another 20 years before I get good at this. Um, so I wanted to talk really briefly about the cider that you all tasted when you came in. Um, eight years ago, there was essentially uh, two people making hard cider in Maine. One in Franklin at Shalom Orchards, and one down in Brooksville at Salzier Winery. Um, and now, as you all probably all noticed, there's been this explosion, this cider renaissance. Um, and one thing that's really fascinating to me about this is many, many of the apples that were grown in this area would be used for dual purposes. They'd be used for fresh eating and storage, and they'd also be used for <coughs> cider. Um, and so it's very exciting to me because, in fact, now these fruit, which basically had no economic use, um, at least for the last uh, 50 or 60 years, suddenly um, have a real use, and people are starting to plant them again. Um, Norum Vega cider back there, Rocky Ground cider. There's one down in um, New Gloucester called Portersfield, one in Lincolnville called Whaleback. Among those four growers, I think they planted more new trees in the state of Maine than had been planted in a generation. Each one of them was planting three, four, five hundred trees. And that just is very, very uncommon in Maine. Um, Ricker Hill, who also is uh, back there as well, um, may have replanted that many trees in a year. But so there's been a real boom. Um, Central qualities of cider apples. Yeah, so what makes for a good cider apple? Obviously, this is going to be completely different from an apple that you just want to take off the tree and take a bite out of. Um, so there are three things that matter in a cider apple blend. And typically, cider makers will use more than one, just one type of apple in order to achieve the perfect blend. So they're looking for sugar content, they're looking for acidity, and they're looking for tannins. So sugars, I think that's kind of self-explanatory. So that's what's going to lead to sweetness, but it also has another very, very important uh, element to adding to the cider, which is that is the source of ethanol production for the yeast to chew on. Um, acidity is going to balance out the sweet profiles um, and lead you more to the sharp end 
of the spectrum. Um, and tannins, you might be familiar with the word tannins if you're a wine drinker, but that is the flavor that when you take a bite of an apple and it sucks up all the moisture out of your mouth and you pucker and you just want to spit it out. It's that real bitter, bitter flavor. But that makes for an incredibly complex and beautiful cider blend. So these, this is kind of why those cider apples are no good for eating. Um. So the cider making process, I, I always love when I get to show off the, some of the photographs that I've collected over the last several years. I'm an avid uh, apple and cider memorabilia collector of, of sorts. This is a photograph of apple picking from the 1880s in Maine. And when I, when I started talking with Ellie about doing this talk, I was like, I know exactly the first picture that I want to use in the historic <laughs> book. Because um, where do the yeasts on the apples come from? Right? They come from the orchard, they come from the orchard environment, they come from the ground. And in this case, um, this is very typical of how cider would have, uh, apples would have been harvested. They're shaken on the ground and then picked up, um, often after windfall events or whatever, um, and then thrown into the wagon uh, where all kinds of things have been collected. <laughs> um, and so these apples would be immediately inoculated in the orchard. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna leave some of these shrivelly apples that from my basement for Ellie to look at. Because the, the yeast will just be right on this skin until uh, it's given food. And so they're just sitting here waiting uh, to tell us who they are. And, and that's how they survive the winter, is by hiding out in mummified fruit that's been sitting on the tree or, or in somebody's uh, cellar. And one of the things that's been really fascinating for me and why when um, MDIBL asked me to do this talk, I immediately said yes, because I had started to think a lot about the microbiome of the orchards and what's happening in the whole process that um, has really you know, changed over time. And one thing for sure is that people are probably not using the wagons that they carted their manure away with uh, for their apples today. But this is a great photograph, in fact, um, I'm trying to track down this woman, Emma Coleman, was a photographer in Maine of many um, sort of agricultural scenes from the 1880s. And her collections are down um, in southern Maine. I'm going to go down and see what, what survives of her photography, because I love this one, the, the posed uh, picking them up off the ground. <clears throat> this is a typical cider mill from Maine. Um, I, we don't have a date from this. This is from the Lovell Historical Society. Um, there's a sort of flying jenny in the back where a horse would be used for grinding up the apples. So the grinder is vertical, so the apples were fed in and then ground between two ridged wheels here, and then put into a large, um, just basically large press with two screws on it, um, all wood. And then you can see the apples stored in the back. So just on the ground, out in the open. Um, and this really drive, is fascinating to me because when I was doing early work on apples, I was interested in dehydrating how they dried apples. And so I asked my neighbor, a guy named Bob Jordan, who was 83 at that point, and his family had been on the property next to me um, since the 1760s. And I said, Bob, you know, you string them out and stuff. How did you all keep dust and bugs and stuff off of the, the apples? And he says, oh, that don't bother. <laughs> right? And I think the idea of storing your apples on the ground, right, um, and sweating them, they called it sweating, they would leave it um, for a week or two to let the fruit start kind of start going um, before they pressed it. Um, I've never figured out with this photograph, um, this guy over here is holding a, a rifle. <laughs> so I don't know what they were doing out in Lovell then, but uh, might have been up to no good. Um, again, here's another one. It's typical a picture, a very similar setup. The, you can't see the press because actually the press is under, uh, under the shed roof on the barn behind us. But you can see the, the spinning jenny here being used to crush the apples. And again, the apples right on the ground. Um, where they would have gotten very good inoculation from uh, all kinds of microorganisms. Um, and uh, so when, when a lot of my cider maker friends start getting fancy about f fermentation, I say, I think they were pretty sure that they could ferment their cider, and they weren't too worried about how it happened. 
because uh, we'll, as we'll talk, people pitched yeast, and they, they've gotten very fancy. Um, everything in this picture is wood. So every part of the process has its own um, microorganisms that have inhabited the press, have had the, um, the grinders. Um, these, this picture I recently acquired is of the, what I think is the last commercial um, cider production, uh, major cider production, a place down in central Maine called Mosho's Farm Orchard. Um, large two-story operation where they would bring the apples in the top, grind them, drop them into the press, press, and then put them into large vats. These are the vats. This is vat number one. <laughs> it's like, well, how many were there, right? Um, so very large, uh, very large operation in a time when cider had already been in decline for quite some time. Um, <clears throat> I found an account of one guy in Winthrop in 1780 who was making 20,000 gallons of cider. So one of the things I think is hard to imagine is the scale of some of this. And when I stumbled across these pictures, I was like, OK, these are pretty big tanks. And, and some substantial number uh, amount of this could have been being turned into vinegar. Um, I haven't been able to find any records from the farm itself and from the orchard. But, but you can get a sense of the scale. And then you can get sense of how they did this fermentation. This is an open wooden tank. Uh, they just put the cider in. And this is actually fermenting. It's boiling up along the edges and driving the um, foam into the middle because it's just an active, natural fermentation from the wood, from the grass that they stored the apples on, from, from everything. Um, and what's really interesting is a lot of contemporary cider makers, they're all worried about getting air in there and that sort of stuff. But this initial fermentation, they just let it open. And then they would, I assume, it would then go into barrels um, for the next fermentation and potentially to be racked off after that. <laughs> so I think Todd already gave it away that while the apples are important, there's something else that's really, really important to this process, and that's our little microbes that are hanging out in there. Um, so they're really the, the major players in this game because apple cider cannot be made without them. So what are they doing in there? Um, so yeast, just like us, they need to eat, and when they eat to make energy, they also produce waste. So their preferred food of choice are sugars, which is rich in an apple juice blend. Um, and they go through a process called fermentation um, to make energy for themselves. And they just so happen to make the waste products that are highly desirable to us, ethanol, which is the alcohol, and carbon dioxide, which makes the bubbly. Um, so let's go into the biochemistry of how that happens. So this is glucose, which is a biochemist's favorite sugar. Um, and they go through a process called glycolysis first, um, which we actually do this too when we're making energy for ourselves. It's basically just the breaking down of sugar. So glyco is sugar and lysis is <coughs> breakdown. Um, and it breaks down to make a little bit of energy for the yeast. And it makes also pyruvate. Um, and that is the, the product for, uh, or that is the starting product for alcoholic fermentation, which actually only happens under anaerobic conditions. So conditions that where there's no oxygen. So a fermentation vessel is a great example of that. Um, and under alcoholic fermentation, that's how the ethanol and the carbon dioxide are made. Um, so when I say yeast, chances are the yeast that you're most familiar with are the little packets of dried pellets that you can buy at Hannaford that you rehydrate and you can use it to make pizza dough and uh, pretzels and all of that stuff. And that indeed is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is um, a type of yeast that has been highly domesticated. But it's also the same type of yeast that brewers use to make beer and winemakers use to make wine. And there's a ton of wild strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae that are also present on the apples. Um, so these are really um, one of the first organisms that were domesticated, really, when we started um, brewing and uh, making other fermented foods. We might not have known it at the time because we didn't know what a microorganism was. Uh, 
but we were domesticating yeast. So those strains have <coughs> been um, purified over time and now um, we've gotten down to the pack, the little packet that you see there, but there's really so much more to that. So not all yeasts are the same. So um, in brewing, um, there are two kind of major types of yeast that everybody's heard of. Uh, there's the ale yeast, which is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which prefers warmer conditions when it's a top fermenter, and it'll make all of these fruity, nice compounds when it's fermenting. But there's also a lager yeast, which was more recently domesticated, maybe uh, five or 600 years ago. Um, and it actually it was an accident. So uh, Saccharomyces pastorianus um, is a hybrid yeast. So um, <coughs> Uh, when there was a lot of trade happening between Europe and South America, some wild Saccharomyces accidentally made its way somehow back into European fermentation vessels and hybrids created a hybrid with Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So it brought back with it its qualities of being cold tolerant, um, and that's uh, why a lager will ferment at a colder temperature. Um, it also has the habit of being a bottom fermenter, so it'll sink to the bottom of a fermentation vessel. Um, and it also produces a different flavor profile. Um, <coughs> uh, a lager tends to be like a more crisp and clean beverage. So those are just two different uh, species of Saccharomyces. Um, and uh, there are <coughs> hundreds of strains that different brew that brewers will use of just either of those species. So within a species, there's also hundreds of different strains. Um, and this is the same for wine making. Um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is really common in many different types of wine, but champagne yeast um, is a different species. And once again, um, you can have hundreds of these different strains commercially available to you. They're all domesticated. Um, you just get like a dried sample of it that you rehydrate and um, it's very predictable. So most of the cider that you've tasted today is made in a way that is completely different from what Todd just described. Um, it's made to be mass produced and to be a consistent product because that's what, part of what we like as consumers is to be able to go to the store, buy something, you try it, you like it, and then a month later you can still buy it and it's the same thing. So the challenge for a cider maker there is to make sure that all of the conditions are really well controlled for, including uh, which microbes you let in to your brew. Um, so we talked about how <coughs> yeast is important because it makes the alcohol and the uh, carbon dioxide, but there's also a bunch of different secondary products of fermentation um, because the yeast are also doing other metabolic processes. Um, and this is kind of the source of where most of the variation comes from is they produce all of these little um, chemicals uh, that are highly volatile and that are really important um, for, for flavors and scents. So uh, one category that I love are the esters. So esters tend to be fruity and really volatile. So um, this particular ester kind of gives a green apple scent and it's very uh, common in cider. Um, higher alcohols also. So this is um, isoamyl alcohol, uh, which smells like bananas. It's in banana oil. Um, and fun fact about this one, bees also produce it to communicate with each other. Um, if they're in a dangerous situation, they're trying to recruit other bees to the site to uh, sting. So that's why you should never eat banana candy in the wild. <laughs> and additionally, uh, phenolic compounds. So uh, this compound is uh, found in Arab Kakasi, but it also is related to kind of a Band-Aid scent um, that some brewers and cider makers talk about. Um, I don't know if I've ever smelled it, but yes, all of these little volatiles that the yeast give off. <laughs> You've smelled the band-aid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, are uh, super important for uh, the, the variability in what the final product's gonna look like. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've already talked a little bit about this with the traditional uh, fermentation methods. Um, one of the things that I think I would emphasize about this is this 
to, to think about the contemporary um, cider maker as really um, in sort of a winemaking tradition, trying to control factors, whereas people traditionally press juice, put it in barrels, let it ferment. Um, and what's interesting to me, I've, I've often said to my students, I think historically that people would probably say, well, geez, let's go over to you know, George's house. He has good cider. And then, you know, if I invited people over for my side, well, geez, uh, I'm busy, you know, because <laughs> you would have different um, colonies in your barrels and your cellar, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that's really interesting to me is whether people can rediscover those traditional fermentation techniques, because now they're really trying to control so much that, that essentially um, every description, historic description that I've read, um, they were not attempting, they, they didn't seek to control their ciders. And actually, one of the ciders back there, Rocky Ground, is all natural ferments um, and has a lot of complexity to it. And one of the things that I think is so fascinating about this, I just uh, recently went to northern Spain with um, Anna Davis, our farm manager from Beach Hill Farm, and John Bunker from uh, Fedco Trees in Mafka um, into Asturias. And the cider they make there, essentially in England, would just be thrown out as being defective because of the ways, the, the way that it ferments and the different um, esters and compounds and phenolic uh, compounds that are in there uh, that, are, that would be referred to politely as funky, right? And so the cultures of agriculture and the cultures of fermentation really have to do with um, actually not trying to control things um, because they would, for example, in, in the um, Asturias and the Basque country, they would leave the pumice after they've ground it for two to three days before they started pressing it. Um, so apples probably stored exactly like you saw on the ground. Once they grind it up, they let everything just get going before they press. And I recently read an account from Maine that was very similar, basically that you wait until your pumice starts to froth, which most people would be like, whoa. <laughs> just like, I don't want that. So I think one of the things about traditional and contemporary um, cider making techniques is um, this idea of consistency. We were just talking about this. Like, They could not have expected in any way the beginning of a barrel of cider to taste anything like the bottom of the barrel. right? Um, and so one of the things that's really fascinating for us as consumers is whether we will, um, and, they, and in England, they still in many areas, they'll press the cider in October, September, October, um, start it fermenting, and they'll start drinking it in December, like a month old. And here it's like, you know, you have to let it sit in the primary fermentation, the secondary fermentation, and bottle it, and the age, blah, 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 blah. In England, they just drink it. They ferment it, and they drink it. So I think it's really interesting to think about um, these different um, histories of our relationship with microbes and maybe the contemporary compulsion to control them. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> So we already gave this away. Yep. How did people make cider before they even knew what yeast was, let alone did they pitch it into their, um, into their fermentation vessels? But of course, there's yeast all around us. And there are a lot of people that are interested in um, finding these strains of yeast and actually purifying them, isolating these strains so that um, we can kind of reach a compromise between the traditional methods where you're just <coughs> trying to get a brew that's teeming with all kinds of microbes and the, the modern methods where you want consistency. So um, this guy, <laughs> Justin from Maniacal Yeast, he is a character. And I went to a talk that he gave. Um, he is a wild yeast safari man is my best way to describe him. So he goes out and he tries to find wild yeast wherever. He had a crazy story about like hanging out the window of a single engine plane trying to get yeast that are like up on a jet stream. <laughs> and then he takes them home, cultures them, and isolates them and tries to sell them to breweries um, that are interested in uh, the unique profiles that will be made by uh, different wild strains of yeast, but also be able to be uh, using that consistently for a consistent product. Um, so where can we find all of these yeasts? Well, they are everywhere. If you've ever made sourdough starter, um, you know that your kitchen is a great place to recruit wild yeast. 
you can just leave flour and water out and the yeast will colonize. The kitchen's great, it's warm, you're bringing in food, you're bringing in people, all of these um, things will create like a nice environment for, for different yeast. Um, they hide out on fruit. Um, because they love sugar, um, they'll naturally live on the surface of fruit. Um, and they'll also hang out on other plant matter. So flowers, vegetables, trees, they love to hang out on uh, birch bark is a good environment for yeast. Um, they're floating in the air <laughs> and they're on you. They're a natural part of your microbiome. So they're everywhere just waiting to be found. So I want to do like a little personality assessment really quick. And I want to find out like, is every, are you a sac or are you a brett? So that refers to Saccharomyces cerevisiae or Botanomyces, which is a popular type of wild yeast that, I mean, you'll find out. So just keep score amongst yourself. So are you more of like a consistent, predictable, reliable type or are you a wild card? Do you like familiar yeasty bready flavors or could you go either way fruity like tropical fruit pineapple or even like horse blanket, grassy, <laughs> barn sense like that? Um, do you tend to be like a friendly likable character or are you kind of not for everybody? <laughs> um, and do you enjoy like a nice ale or even a lager but just nothing too crazy or are you wild for lambics and sour beer? So how many uh, sacks do we have in the audience? <laughs> We've got to check. How many Bretts do we have? <laughs> Just a couple? Well, I think that's a great mix. I think that's a great mix. <laughs> so I think that we should look at some yeast next. I don't know um, if you're into that, but I am. <laughs> so these actually, um, these are some yeast from a Matthias's cider, he's back there. So I'm gonna try to get them in focus here. And you can see there's quite a range of little shapes and sizes here. So the ones that are kind of smaller and rounder are probably Saccharomyces, but the ones that are bigger or making kind of rod shaped, um, uh, even colonies or uh, they're coming together. Those are uh, probably Britannomyces. And there's also probably um, some other yeast strains uh, beyond that um, in here. So this is really, there's really a lot going on in here. This is pretty impressive. If you were to take any of those cans, um, you probably wouldn't see a whole lot of this activity. But um, just for fun, if anybody tried the rocky ground, we noticed that when we opened the bottle, it kind of made a little explosion, um, <laughs> which, which Todd and I immediately were like, it's alive, what's in there? Um, so I'm gonna see if I can get these in frame. Um, this is just like fresh, all out of the bottle kind of stuff here. So I'm actually gonna get this in frame. What's the magnification, Ellie? A 400X. While you're doing that, I have a question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not all yeasts are friendly. That's so. very true. Yeah, and not all yeasts are desirable for for brewing. Um, uh, Britannomyces often produces off flavors, but then there's also the yeasts that are um, kind of bad for us that are naturally present in our microbiome, but can be opportunistic, like candida yeast. And those are not typically gonna be found. Oh, there's one. <laughs> and it's budding up there. <laughs> um, which, which means that it has plenty of, plenty of stuff to eat while it's actually in that rocky ground bottle and it's still fermenting, which is why it was so, so bubbly and actually cool. probably a little bit more alive than it should have been. <laughs> okay. I, Steve, one answer to the, about the cider is um, the tolerance to alcohol. Um, at least in principle, <clears throat> one of the things that happens is you have you know, tons of different species, sub-varieties, et cetera, et cetera, and they'll take, um, some will start out the fermentation and then they'll die off and others will take over. And at least the ones, uh, the ones that are dangerous to human beings um, tend to be when the, when the cider gets to around five to six percent alcohol, 
um, they're the ones that don't do, do well in, in those circumstances, which is one reason why the state of Maine and other states require a certain alcohol level in the cider is to ensure the, that some of those, um, uh, not just yeast, but other microorganisms don't, um, don't persist in the cider. Um, and it's quite interesting. They've done some studies on that, story and cider, and they just track week by week which, which microorganisms. So we think like the yeast is doing its work, it's, but it's, at one point it's this yeast, and then it's another yeast, and then it, you know, those die off, and another one blooms. Um, and one of the things about wild yeasts is at least one of the reasons that people pitch champagne yeasts and others is because they're super aggressive. They will, they will ferment through till, to dryness no matter what. Whereas the local yeasts um, can sometimes, you know, get what's called stuck. They'll not ferment fully through and, and that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, that's I think part of the answer to the to your question. <clears throat> so Todd, here's some yeast from the uh, the leaves that you gave me. Excellent. So this is what you have going on in here. So so there's some little lemon kind of shaped leaves, mm -hmm. uh, yeast, and I um, I think those are Hansonia spora. Uh, yeast, so those are often actually present on grapes, but they could be on apples too. Hmm. And then um, there's some other little things wiggling around in here that are not yeast, but they're actually probably bacteria. Mm. Yum. <laughs> so, this, is, this is from a two-year-old uh, bottle that, that she said, do you have anything? I was like, I think there's something in here. <laughs> so. Yeah. So we could obviously isolate the yeast out by, like you said, continuing, giving it fresh wort and continuing fermentation mm -hmm. um, to make a less hospitable environment for bacteria. But actually, not all bacteria are totally bad. So I'm going to go back to our PowerPoint um, here. Uh, but we can play with, if you guys are into it, we can play with more yeast. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to be disappointed if you say no. <laughs> All right, so yeah, like we got to um, bacterial diversity <coughs> is also going to find its way in there. If you're leaving your apples out on the ground, you're handling them, bacteria are going to find their way in there. Um, and most of the time, they will be killed by the alcohol level. But there are a couple of species of bacteria that are actually pretty tolerant to alcohol. And a lot of those are actually not terrible to have in there and actually could be quite nice. So lactic acid producing bacteria like lactobacillus, enococcus, or sporolactobacillus are all great because they'll, they'll drive the cider toward malolactic fermentation. So it's taking this sharp malic acid and turning it into a nicer, softer acid, lactic acid. So that, depending on what you're going for, it could be a desirable thing. Um, but on the bottom there, I have a couple of gram-negative staining bacteria that are not so desirable. So Zymomonas is responsible for something called cider sickness, which just doesn't sound very nice. Um, but that is the overgrowth of uh, acid aldehyde, which kind of has a nice green apple scent in low amounts. But in high amounts, it's going to taste really chemically. And it's also going to quickly turn into acetic acid and make vinegar. And speaking of acetic acid, um, acetobacter is a is an acetic acid <coughs> producing bacteria. So that's going to turn your cider into vinegar. Luckily, that only thrives under aerobic conditions, so in the presence of oxygen. So as long as you can mostly keep oxygen out of your fermentation vessel, you probably won't accidentally make vinegar. Um, and also, enterobacteria, I have to mention. These are the, the bacteria like E. coli that could actually make you sick. So those are things that you don't want on your side. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I guess let's go into acetobacter fermentation. And I don't know, Todd, if you want to talk about what you have in here a little bit. Um, I took a whiff of this, and it was pretty vinegary. Um, but uh, these bacteria basically turn the ethanol that's in your cider into acid aldehyde, which is quickly turned into acetic acid. So essentially, if you don't pay attention, your cider could turn to vinegar. Um, so this is an airlock um, that basically is supposed to keep this as an aerobic, anaerobic fermentation. Um, and if you um, are doing too much uh, cider uh, tasting or fruit exploration or apple sleuthing or fly fishing or something like that, <laughs> this can dry out and the acetobacter will immediately get in. 
And um, I, I sort of knew this when I, when I uh, brought this in, uh, because this has turned into a lovely uh, cider vinegar now, uh, because the acetobacter, basically the, the airlock broke, and they got in there. Our friends, the fruit flies, will make sure that they get there. And if there's a way for them to get in, sometimes these will fill with uh, fruit flies if you have uh, if you have the misfortune of having <coughs> fruit flies in your house. And they will, almost immediately, if the airlock breaks, the acetobacter will get in there. So, so um, after seeing all of those microbes, hopefully you aren't freaked out and you will never drink cider again. <laughs> um, maybe you can have an appreciation for how many different species of microscopic living things there are um, even just in one of these jars. And we think of the microbiome as something in our stomachs. There's a lot of literature about how you want to take probiotics to make a healthy microbiome. But actually, I think we can extend the definition or how we think about the microbiome to, um, to the orchard and what is a healthy population of bacteria and yeast and other microbes uh, in that environment that's going to add to the ecosystem and make a nice environment for the insects and pollinators and plants and the people who love to drink cider. So what factors affect the microbiome of an orchard? All kinds of things. So for something as diverse in a climate as the apple, obviously, uh, everybody's distracted by the robot video. <laughs> Obviously, um, where in the world um, the apples are grown is going to have an effect on what uh, microorganisms are present. Um, the biodiversity of the soil and the surrounding vegetation, the agricultural procedures, so and the harvesting methods. So if your apples are picked by laser shooting robots instead of people, that's going to give you a different um, uh, microbiome to the orchard. It's going to have fewer kind of like human influences to, to its microbiome. Um, and I'm wondering if anybody else is as interested in me in learning how to tame your own wild yeast. So I, ha I brought like little vials and, and yeast wrangling kits. If anybody wants to grab one on your way out, they'll be set up on this table. Um, but I recently went on a wild yeast safari of my own after being inspired by maniacal yeast. So uh, there's, a, there's a seed swap and scion exchange that goes on at MACRA in, um, in April or March? March, yep. March, and it's a fun event. People bring scion wood from their orchards and gardens um, and exchange it in case you want to graft um, your own apple trees and you want a different variety. Um, but I was there with a bunch of different vials and swabs actually looking to pick up different types of microorganisms that had been on the scion wood. And I found a couple of cool things. Um, you can see that there were some color changes that I observed. Um, some of these got like super pressurized and I had to burp them because there was so much CO2 being produced. They all smell different. And I found a couple different things that I could look at under a microscope. Um, so please, if you're interested, Grab a yeast wrangling kit on your way up. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to close with um, with some some appreciation for um, I don't I thought maybe we might have some people that were underage here, but um, it doesn't seem like we are. But wild yeast <laughs> is not just for cider, and it's not just for alcohol. There's all kinds of um, food products that are made uh, with microorganisms uh, that you might not even know. So even chocolate and bread and, of course, vinegar um, and things like kombucha and tempeh and yogurt and all kinds of fermented yummy vegetables like sauerkraut. Uh, we live in a world teeming with microorganisms, and this is a good thing. <laughs> Thank you. so much. It was terrific. Are there questions? Anyone have questions for speakers? I have a question. I won't ask Todd because I've asked him this before. Uh, Ellie, maybe you can answer this question. Does cider have any, hard cider have any benefits other than alcohol, i.e., did it 
specifically pain, vitamin C? Um, vitamin C, I, I'm not sure about vitamin C, but I would say that there are definitely health benefits. So especially for, for a cider that's made in a traditional method, like we just saw some incredibly helpful microorganisms that could be really good probiotics for us. And there's also lots of polyphenol compounds and other antioxidants that are, that are good. So every, all of the health benefits that you read about red wine, you could say the same about cider. There's lots of little uh, compounds in there that could be beneficial. It prevent scurvy. It has vitamin, it has vitamin uh, B complexes. So if you don't, if you leave some of the leaves in your cider, it has vitamin B in it. Um, I don't know about Yeah, I'm uh, trying to think scurvy. about what would happen to citric acid yeah. because it's definitely present in apple juice, but I'm not sure if it gets fermented. Probably not completely. I would say it's a safe bet against scurvy. I, I would suggest... <laughs> <laughs> I, I would suggest eating an apple with your cider. Right. That way your, your vitamin B, your vitamin C. Okay. <laughs> uh, question on... Uh, when we buy a gallon of cider at the yes. supermarket, that's not hard cider. No, that's sweet cider, yeah. Does that have microorganisms in it? Most of the time it's been pasteurized, but yeah. depending on the farm, probably not. So um, <clears throat> not only is it often almost always pasteurized, though there are some that are not, it also has um, preservatives in it that suppress, um, so potassium sorbate, some other things that they put in there, that are preservatives also suppress some of the microorganisms in them. But, um, and if that's not too high and you just like open it up and leave it, it'll just, in uh, five days, it'll just start bubbling over. Um, now sometimes we'll get them that are uh, cloudy, opaque, mm -hmm. or sometimes absolutely clear. Yeah. Uh, they've taken some of the solid stuff out. They have. What yeah. difference does that make? Um, the solids just give, um, will give, um, will give some more character to the hard cider. Um, often, um, a lot of the flavor is actually in the skin, so how they process it. This is one of the very funny things in America. Um, we have apple juice, which is filtered cider, uh, because people prefer clear things. Um, but this, the, the cloudier the cider and the uh, for, for hard cider, the longer, it ha the more chunks and stuff it has in it, it actually makes a better cider often. So, What's, um, what's your preferred method for keeping the cider and not allowing it to go completely dry? If you get sound like sweet, do you fill off the yeast? Or do you just use a yeast that's going to die up on its own or cold crash? Or? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so historically, all the cider was completely dry. So they would just let it go completely to, to dryness. So um, there are extremely complicated ways of retaining some residual sweet sweetness. Um, you can allow it to stall. You can um, filter it. You can take the yeast out. If you rack the cider off several times, you can take away enough si uh, yeast from it that it will preserve some of the, the um, sweetness. Um, there's a technique in England called keeving, where pectins actually create a sort of what's called the chabrun, which is a brown sort of gelatinous thing on the top that will take the yeast out of circulation. Um, I often say that at a home scale, preserving sweetness, um, the best way to do that is add a little bit of sweet, sweet cider when you drink it, because it's very complicated to do it. They're very, they're if you're like super technical and you like that kind of stuff, I can, there's a great book by Claude Jolicoeur called The New Cider Maker's Handbook, and he'll describe exactly how you can use really complicated techniques to try to stop the yeast from fermenting. What, what do they do on most of these they filter. commercial ones? I mean, because most of them are a little sweet. They'll, they back They're back sweetened, yeah. They add so sugar. at the end of fermentation, they'll yeah. add more juice or just sugar or yeah. some of them pineapple, all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. And a lot of the commercial ciders, like Angry Orchard and stuff like that, put sucralose, which is backwards sugar, so the yeast can't metabolize it. Do they ever uh, treat cider the same way they would do with, say, port, by introducing additional alcohol to raise the alcohol content, thereby killing the yeast to preserve the sugar? 
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so there was a pretty booming apple brandy industry in, in Maine and other parts of the country. Um, and I think one of the things that um, they would do here, also they would do like Apple Jack, so they'd freeze it, so that it's freeze fermentation, so that you get a higher alcohol content. Um, but I don't think they ever did anything like pour it, like a, um, in, enhancing it. Though there are some, there are some descriptions of them adding rum to it, but just because they wanted more alcohol. <laughs> uh, so, and there is a, there is a, there is a product called ice cider now that's been being produced in Quebec, which is like a. It's like a ice wine, so very high sugar of fruit, so it produces a higher, uh, a higher alcohol. Um, it's it's really really nice because it can concentrate some of the, um, some of the polyphenols and, and that sort of stuff. In the back, yeah. Yes, I made apple cider over the years. Not my son-in-law, Augusta, because Augusta's about fifty to seventy gallons a year. Uh huh. We've had mixed results when we tried to turn it into hard cider. Yeah. Not, not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> we, uh, like I say, we'll get to about 50 or 70 gallons, and then uh, we freeze it. And that seems to hold the flavor through it. Mm -hmm. you know, most of the stuff we, we don't sell, we just give it away. It's fun. And basically, you buy drops for like $50 a pickup truck. So we fill a couple of pickup trucks, and our dresses are like 100 years old, 80 years old, and do it the old fashioned way. Mm -hmm. Drink it right, drink it right, and it comes out. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's a little, yeah. little more tricky trying to ferment. Yeah, the one thing I would say, um, so when you go from sweet cider to hard cider, um, you have to have uh, some cider apples. You have to have some spitters. You have to have some crabs in there. You have to have some interesting apples. Well, you've got to use at least three apples. Yeah. Uh, three varieties. Yeah. So in in Maine, um, many many varieties like golden russet were used for making hard cider because the the russeted skin has a lot of the tannins in it. But we lost almost all of our traditional cider varieties in the 1830s. And so what we have for dessert fruits are all high high acid and high sugar. So they tend to make very dry and very acidic ciders. And so I don't know how many of you know, there's some traditional varieties called sweets. Tolman Sweet, um, for example, is one locally. Um, Bailey Sweet. Those have no acidity. And so if you have a third of those or more, they don't create that sort of acidic, sharp, buddy, almost vinegary flavor, which a lot of the fresh, the, our local um, dessert varieties will. Um, yeah. I have a question about the vinegar. Uh, part of the process. So um, if you let vinegar go for a bit, you get vinegar ips. Those little nematodes yep. flap mm -hmm. around in the bottom. Yep. Where do they come <coughs> in the picture? Where do they come from? That's interesting. What do they do? <laughs> so I've had those in my kombucha brew before, and I was terrified. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. But I read that they can hang out on the feet of fruit flies, and the fruit flies, obviously, they want to flock to anything that smells like vinegar because they want to get on that. So the, if the fruit fly gets in, it can also um, release these vinegar eels, and then they can take over. But if you have, if you have an airlock or something going on that's going to prevent fruit flies from getting in, unless your fruit, your airlock fills with fruit flies like Todd was talking about, um, then you could probably be protected from them. <coughs> what do they, do they eat the yeast? Is that what they're working on? And also, have they oh, yeast. survived the alcoholic phase of the whole process? So they're probably, um, I'm not completely sure, so you'll have to look at this, but I think that they're interested in actually the bacteria. So we have little nematodes that we study at the at the lab here, C. elegans, and they feed on E. coli. That's mm. where they get their nutrients. So yeasts mm. are probably too big for the nematode to eat, but they're probably after the Acetobacter and other bacteria that are in there. And I guess they're just fine with the vinegar content and alcohol content. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you all so much for being here.
couple of quick comments before you leave. There's a little more cider back there if you want to taste. Now that you're filled with all this intimate knowledge about how, <laughs> how cider is made, please feel free. Also, don't forget to grab your little um, yeast kit if you'd like to make your own yeast. And for those of you that are here for the first time, please feel free to register with us so that you can be on our email list for our upcoming science campaign. Thank you all.